Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from the After Lunch series with your MGH ALS nurses. I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. And also, I just want to remind everyone to um, mute your microphones. So um, my name is Judy Carey, and I'm the research, research access nurse from the Healy Center for ALS at Mass General. Today, I am happy to be joined by Dr. Cindy Moore and Dr. Archna Basu. They are both psychologists from the MGH PACT program, which stands for Parenting at a Challenging Time, as well as my research nurse colleague, Maggie Bruno, also from the Healy Center. Cindy Moore and Archna Basu will be sharing their expertise on the topic of talk, talking with children and grandchildren during the challenging times that come along with an ALS diagnosis. Before they begin, I will quickly review disclaimers for our webinar and also, again, just a quick reminder to mute your microphones. So the medical disclaimers. The decision about whether to try any of these recommendations is a decision that you should discuss with your ALS care team. Today's presentation is meant to share information we have learned about parenting at challenging times that may be helpful to you. In mentioning certain ideas, it does not mean that we are telling you to do all of these things. Rather, we are informing you of some recommendations that are shared with our patients depending on their family situation. The information from the webinar is not intended or implied to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. All content, including text, graphics, images, and information is for general information purposes only. We encourage you to confirm any information obtained from or through this webinar with other sources and review all information regarding any medical condition or treatment with your provider. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking medical treatment because of the information provided in this webinar. Privacy disclaimer. During this presentation and question and answer following, if you choose to type a question in the chat box, please know that other attendees may be able to see your name and question. Please check your audio and video settings on your computer when you enter the webinar as you may be heard by others or visible on our shared screen. We share this information with you to be mindful of your privacy preferences. So for those of you who have never listened in to one of our um, after lunch webinars, we'd just like to quickly share with you how the after lunch series came to be. Um, the ALS nurses always lunch together where we would discuss clinical care and, and learn from each other about our patients. We decided to share the conversation in a webinar platform with patients and caregivers inside and outside of Mass General, which um, created the After Lunch series to incorporate the letters ALS. We now invite our colleagues, such as Cindy Moore and Archna Basu, uh, who share with our patients their expertise. We hope that this will be used as a, to a teaching tool and a resource guide for you as it will be kept on our webinar for future viewing at uh, www.massgeneral.org forward slash ALS. So the webinar agenda for today is they, um, both Cindy and Archna will talk about us with the overview of the MGH Healy Center ALS PACT program. Then they will discuss ALS affecting the family. They will share with you the PACT model for parents' guidance in supporting children's capability to cope and adapt. Then we will have some questions and answers that are commonly asked in our clinic. And then we will open up um, for some time for you to also ask us questions and answers. Without further ado, we will pass, um, pass the baton to Cindy to go ahead and start the presentation. Thanks for the introduction, Judy, You're and welcome. thank you for inviting us to be here today. Arch and I are really pleased to, to join the webinar. <clears throat> uh, we wanted to start by sharing a little bit about how this fairly new program at Mass General got started. Um, we know that families experience the impact of ALS on all aspects of their lives, on their professional roles and activities and friendships, and not least of all, on family roles. 
And in particular, the role of parent is central to the identity of adults with children. And that means that changes that affect how we care for and interact with children also affect how we feel about ourselves. And a serious illness in any family member, of course, affects every family member, including children. We estimate that roughly a third of people with ALS are parenting dependent children. And that proportion is higher if you include grandparents who provide regular care for grandchildren. So finding ways to support patients in the parenting role has the potential to benefit a lot of people. Some of the members of the Healy Center ALS team were familiar with a program in the Mass General Cancer Center called the Marjorie E. Corf Parenting at a Challenging Time Program, or PACT program for short. This program was founded in 1988 by a child psychiatrist named Paula Rausch, who continues to direct it, and I joined the team in 2003. Currently, our team of five clinicians and a postdoctoral fellow provide parent guidance consultations during the course of a patient's cancer care here. Thanks to philanthropic and cancer center support, we're able to provide these consultations at no charge to patients. And over the past 12 years, we've spoken with about 3,000 parents of more than 6,500 children. Over the past several years, our Cancer Center PAC team piloted a really limited collaboration with the ALS clinic in response to a growing awareness of a need for parenting support for families and children, for families with children and home who were affected by this challenging, challenging disease. So when philanthropic support became available about a year ago, we were eager to build on what we had learned in the Cancer Center PAC program and to create a program specifically for the ALS clinic. Dr. Rausch and I were both able to devote about a half day a week to the project, and we're really fortunate that Dr. Arch Nabasu, a psychologist with over 15 years of experience in working with families on issues of trauma and grief and concerns of depression and anxiety, agreed to dedicate a day and a half each week to help develop the program. So starting in January 2019, our team of two psychologists, Archana and I, and a psychiatrist, Paula, have been available as part of the multidisciplinary ALS clinic to meet with parents for parent guidance consultations. Um, we're talking mainly with parents who have dependent children, meaning infants through young adults, as well as some grandparents who are caregivers for young children. And after an initial in-person meeting, we're also able to offer phone calls or telehealth visits for follow-up. So as Dr. Moore mentioned, um, we hear from parents with ALS about how the diagnosis can affect their identity, how they feel and function in the different roles they have, including and importantly in the role as a parent, and how that might affect children. But in scoping the research literature, there is in fact very limited empirical research on the impact of a parent's diagnosis of ALS on their children. Data from one small study of school-age children looking at a range of behavioral and mental health indicators found increased anxiety and depressive symptoms in children with a parent with ALS relative to children whose parents did not have a diagnosis of ALS. Another aspect of family functioning to consider is that co-parents' availability for children may also change due to a variety of reasons. For instance, co-parents often serve as primary caregivers to the parent with ALS and can spend extensive time caring for the parent, even when they have home care assistance. Also, co-parents have their own emotional and psychological adjustment to their, parent, to their partner's diagnosis, and this is an ongoing process. The progressive nature of the symptoms and disabilities have been shown to be associated with increases in depressive and anxiety symptoms in individuals caring for someone with ALS. So children may experience the impact of a parent's diagnosis in multiple ways. So Archana mentioned the limited research on symptoms in children who have a parent with ALS, and also some of the emotional and logistical effects on the co-parent at home that likely affect their parenting. Um, we can also generalize from what we've learned about how a cancer diagnosis affects parenting and make some educated guesses about parenting with ALS, even though we're mindful of the differences. Um, so almost 200 parents treated in one of two Boston cancer centers completed a questionnaire about the impact of cancer on their children. And what we found was that many parents had concerns about how the illness was affecting their children, and some parents were really distressed about this. Many worried about the emotional impact of their cancer on children and their ability to meet children's day-to-day -day practical needs, 
and the impact of their own changes in mood or thinking or energy levels on children. Some were also concerned about the support they were receiving or not from a co-parent. And people reporting a worse quality of life in terms of the physical and emotional symptoms and say their ability to participate in social activities, those people also tended to have more concerns about the impact of cancer on children. And for everyone, having these kinds of parenting concerns was linked to symptoms of distress, anxiety, and depression in parents. So this research was meaningful because it documented a really important part of what patients were experiencing that wasn't receiving much attention in many cancer centers. And it made it easier to make a case for the importance of providing parenting support. So what do we mean by parenting support or parent guidance? And what are the goals of our consultations with parents? <clears throat> well, the main goal is to support children's positive adjustment and capacity to thrive in response to a parent's life-limiting condition. So our intent is not to provide psychotherapy to either parents or children. Instead, when we meet with parents to talk about children, we assume that parents know their children best and are in the best position to advocate and reach out to community support on their behalf. As clinicians, we're bringing backgrounds in mental health and child development, as well as an understanding of how medical conditions can affect family dynamics. We're trying to collaborate with parents to try to enhance the parents' skills in supporting their own children. So today we will highlight some of the key aspects of our work with families in the PACT model such as the value of open communication, ways to protect child-centered family time, how parents can support emotional skill building for their children, ways in which parents can consider maximizing support from the community, and the importance of parental self-care. In thinking about communication, one of the first things that parents usually ask us is, how do we tell our children about my diagnosis? Some parents wonder whether they should tell children at all. While there's no one-size-fits-all approach to this question in terms of how and when parents share the news, because it depends on a variety of factors, our overarching approach is to focus on supporting parents in an age-appropriate and, in, in age and open communication with children. To do this, we begin by understanding different aspects of the family. For instance, a child's developmental stage is an important factor. How you may explain ALS to a five-year-old versus a teen who can cognitively understand information like an adult and is likely to research symptoms online would be quite different. Also, children have unique personalities and temperament. Some are more expressive. Other children may be internal processors or quiet thinkers. Families also have specific cultural beliefs that may play a role in how they communicate with their children. Also, because each parent's course and progression of ALS can be very different, we work with parents and our medical colleagues to consider each parent's unique medical presentation in determining how they may share information about their diagnosis and symptoms with their children. Communicating about ALS is an ongoing process. In the early stages, we work with parents to think through what might be possible times that might be relatively better than others to share information about the diagnosis. For instance, whether a child has final exams or an important personal milestone, such as a concert that they've been practicing for. Sometimes families decide to include another family member who can be a supportive presence both for the child or themselves. Weekends or bedtimes may offer quieter opportunities in the week for parents and children to talk. Then parents can begin by asking children what they might have noticed, because children often notice some of the visible changes in their parents or grandparents, and may even have said something like, dad is not running around with me as much as he used to, or he doesn't throw the ball as well as he could. Sometimes visible interventions such as a leg brace or a hand splint or a pick line may spark questions and serve as a starting point for a conversation with your children. We encourage parents to use simple, accurate terms to name the condition. So calling it ALS or saying that it is a motor neuron disease and then explaining what it means. 
Naming the condition allows the family to have a shared understanding of what it is the family is coping with, to discuss the questions that children may have, and to know what to expect and plan for. Avoiding talking about the condition can, making it, can make it a mysterious or confusing thing. Children may not know how to understand what they are seeing or who they can talk to, which can increase worries and leave them feeling confused on their own. Hearing difficult news from a parent in a safe and familiar setting can help them to begin processing this information in a way that they feel supported. As a parent said, I'm sad that my daughter's vocabulary now includes the term ALS, but I also know that this is important because she now has a way to understand what she sees and a way to ask me questions. Because teens and young adults can cognitively understand the information as most adults do, and they may already have been looking up information online, parents can talk about the diagnosis as they know it. But for younger children, the term ALS may not mean much, and so explaining it to them using examples can be helpful. One possible analogy that families could use is to think about how electricity runs through a house. So saying something along the lines of, just like in our house when we flip the switch, electric signals run through the wires to start up the lights and other electronics, in the human body, the brain sends signals to talk to different muscles to tell the arms or legs to move. In ALS, there's a problem in how the brain talks to the different muscles in the body. There's a problem in sending the signals from the brain to different muscles in the body. In this way, parents can set the stage for many conversations to come. So as Dr. Basu mentioned, talking about ALS is, of course, an ongoing conversation. It's not a one and done sort of a proposition because things continue to change. Um, so it's helpful to find ways to regularly update children and to check in about their understanding and reactions to changes. One way to do this is to ask whether children are noticing new changes in, in how a parent is functioning. So how does dad seem to you recently? And then connect any observations they might make to the disease course, if that makes sense. So something like, you're right, dad isn't helping cook dinner lately and he's sitting down a lot more. As his legs have gotten weaker, and that's because ALS is affecting the nerve cells that connect to his leg muscles, and muscles get weaker when the nerve cells attached to them aren't working properly. If you can, offer realistic reassurance without minimizing the impact of the symptoms. For example, we're going to talk to the doctor about a wheelchair at the next appointment, and we hope that dad will be more able to get around using that. And then try to explore how children are feeling about the changes and the progression of symptoms. You might ask what's hardest about this or what's most confusing. Acknowledge that children could have a mix of feelings that can be also confusing and try to be open to all of them. Talking about emotions tends to be more easily skipped than talking about information, but it can be so important in helping children to understand and manage their own feelings about the situation. <clears throat> and when you're answering children's questions, it can be helpful to try to slow the conversation down. Take time to try to identify what the question behind the question could be. For example, a young child might ask, will dad feel better pretty soon? And that could be their effort to understand what you meant when you said that ALS isn't curable. Or it could mean that they're wondering about whether it will still be possible to go on the family vacation that everyone was looking forward to. Or a middle schooler's question, Will mom be able to come to my band concert? Might mean, I hope she'll be able to hear my solo, or I'm secretly feeling nervous about how my friends might react to seeing her in a wheelchair. So with any questions, it could help to say something like, hmm, that's a good question. What got you wondering about that? And then trying to answer as best you can. Some questions are more dreaded than others. We know that parents understandably feel anxious and sad as they think about how to talk with children about having an incurable condition. It's hard enough to live with this knowledge themselves, and some feel that not talking about the prognosis for ALS is a way to protect children from a burden that they themselves are really struggling with. And figuring out how to talk about prognosis is not easy, um, but it's possible and it's important. 
There's really no one way to approach this that works for every child and family. And so in a webinar like this one, it's, it's hard to come up with recommendations that will feel like they apply to everybody. But based on the literature about communication about other life-limiting diseases and our clinical experience, it's safe to say that we do encourage age-appropriate honesty, even about the potential for death. There are a few reasons for this, including the importance of having children be able to trust parents to say even the hardest things, the same way that parents probably want children to tell them about difficult things that happen to them and in their lives, and maybe particularly in the teenage years. And even when difficult things aren't talked about, very often they're still felt or sensed and worried about. And then the child is feeling alone as they worry, rather than a part of the larger family all trying to support each other. Figuring out what to say about this and when to say it is, of course, hard. And the answer will be a little different depending on how old children are and how quickly a person's functioning is changing. In early conversations, parents can be honest by just not saying that they'll get better or be cured. But you can also highlight other aspects of coping, like the fact that you're focusing on living as well as possible for as long as possible, and that you hope that will be a long time. Um, parents can focus on the idea of working with a medical team to get the best possible help, and might share the, their feeling that science can change very quickly, just like technology changes quickly. And so they're hopeful that new innovations will come along. Parents can share that they're doing their best every day by following the medication or physical therapy treatments that they've developed with their team or whatever, whatever other um, life changes you're making to try to cope. And as Archana and I both mentioned earlier, it's helpful to try to make space for children's feelings about prognosis too. And this can be particularly hard because no parent wants to see their children look upset. But again, it's important to do this because it allows us to help children with these difficult feelings. And having company as we process painful emotions is so helpful. So let children know that you recognize that coping with this condition is hard and sad and has unique challenges that keep evolving and changing, and that's a challenge in its own right. Um, and you might mention that you're looking for support for yourself and for them if that seems applicable. So we've talked about communication within the family. Um, beyond thinking through how to talk about ALS with children, it's worth thinking about how you can talk with people outside the immediate family so that others can also be included in supporting children. It's usually a good idea for someone at your children's school to be aware of the ALS diagnosis, but it helps to first talk with your child about their preferences for disclosure. Um, try to figure out with your child what kind of support at school would feel best to them. Would they like someone to check in once in a while about how things are going at home and how they're doing? Or would they just like to know that school is more of an island of normalcy and that no one will ask anything unless they bring it up first? Um, would it be helpful to just know that if they have a bad day or bad moment, there's a plan that they could just raise their hand and ask to go to the nurse's office and not have to explain everything in front of other students? Teenagers especially can be sensitive about being treated differently because of ALS um, or really anything. Um, but it's still important that someone at school be aware. Uh, but there it may be that the best choice would be a guidance counselor rather than a teacher, at least to start. And when talking with extended family and friends, which is of course important for parents to do to get the support that, that they need, it's helpful to just be careful about sharing things that children don't yet know about. Um, both because children can feel hurt or excluded if they learn that others knew things first, and also because it's really hard, especially in these days of you know, online information, to control where information travels once it's out. And we know of children who learn things about their own parent from another child whose own parents were confided in, or have feelings about information being shared on social media. So it's just important to be thoughtful. And speaking of social media posts, Given that teens and even younger children pretty automatically use the internet to learn about new things, it might be helpful to have an explicit conversation about whether that will be helpful or not in their understanding um, the parents' ALS. So help kids understand that online statistics that they would read on a lot of websites are there to describe groups of people. 
there's a lot of variability in how people with ALS feel and function over time. And so their own parents' experience may be different from the averages that they're reading about online. You could share the example that you know, if you're to go to Fenway Park, for example, um, for a baseball game, you might know that the average age of people attending games is you know, maybe 35 years old. But that doesn't really tell you much about the person in the seat next to you. Could be a five-year-old, could be an 85-year-old. Um, and also remind children that you and your medical team have the best information about your condition and that you'll keep updating them as you learn new things from your team. If they do decide to go online to do research, let them know that you'd really like to talk together about anything that they read. In addition to sharing information about the diagnosis, we also collaborate with parents in enhancing their skills and talking to their children about their children's emotional experiences, which can support their adjustment. One way to think about this is that by acknowledging the range of feelings that children may have, parents are making their emotional life more talkaboutable. Validating children's feelings or possibly sharing some aspects of your own feelings can help to normalize children's emotions. It can also help to make children feel supported as they explore their own worries or questions. Also, children's feelings, much like parents' own feelings, are likely to change or evolve as the symptoms progress. The same family activities are likely to be experienced differently because the ways in which a parent can actively participate changes. We've talked a lot about the value of open communication. But sometimes parents tell us that their child is not much of a talker, and we recognize that children have different personality styles. Some are talkers and others not so much, and forcing a child to talk either with a parent or a professional is not likely to be effective or helpful. Also, sometimes teenagers may confide in others like a friend or another trusted adult because this is pretty typical in adolescence. So the key focus is really to provide opportunities both within the family or through trusted adults that you as parents identify, or by making professional resources such as a school guidance counselor or a therapist available to the children. We also work with parents to consider how to support children's routines and to protect family-centered time. This may take the form of focusing on children's play dates with friends or continued participation in individual hobbies or sports. We consider ways to minimize disruptions to children's routines due to increased medical appointments or because one of the parents is less physically available to take children for their activities. Maintaining children's routines can provide a sense of much needed predictability and stability at a time when so much can feel out of control. Having time together as a family is also often viewed by parents as essential to creating experiences and memories together. Also, creating opportunities to talk on a regular basis as part of daily activities like clearing up after dinner together or walking the dog together can be helpful in many ways. These are opportunities for you as parents to check in with children, for children to ask questions or talk about any recent changes they, have may, they may have noticed, However, keep in mind that children may not always want to discuss something or even be asked how they are doing all the time. But creating the time and space to do so can be valuable for both children and parents alike. Coping with the challenges of ALS certainly takes a village. So we encourage parents to consider who in the different communities in which they are involved might be a source of support or practical help. For instance, in your children's school, uh, a class teacher or a guidance counselor, also neighbors, religious communities or faith-based organizations, parents of children's close friends, extended family, or advocacy groups can all be potential sources of support. In addition to emotional support, families also find themselves receiving many offers of help, like offers for cooked food or drop-offs and pickups for the kids, and managing and coordinating all of this can take on a lot of time and effort. So we do recommend considering the use of some organizational tools. Um, there are certainly lots available online. Um, for example, lotsahelpinghands.com or mealtrain.com, to name a few. And in our PAC team, we also talk about having what we call a captain of kindnesses. 
someone who can be the point person to organize and maximize all these offers for help. Another way in which trusted friends um, can help is in managing medical updates on your behalf. Communicating updates to family, friends, or other well-wishers about how you are doing, any recent changes in symptoms, or how the children are doing can take up a lot of time. And parents tell us that while the support and concern is welcome and well-intentioned, it can also be tiring and emotionally draining. One approach to address this could be to have what we call a Minister of Information, a designated person you trust who could help provide updates on your behalf. Another aspect of maximizing community support could also be to identify trusted adults your children can speak with. Children are often surprisingly protective of parents' feelings, and they may worry about asking questions or sharing something that they think could be upsetting for a parent. So letting them know that there are other adults they can speak with may be helpful. And the final element of our PACT model focuses on parent self-care. And I can imagine that at least a couple of you might be rolling your eyes and thinking, yeah, right, that's not really possible. Um, or maybe have felt guilty when you put something you wanted to do for yourself ahead of something your child was asking of you. Um, we've spent most of this time talking about a variety of things that children need from their parents, all of which take time and focus and being open to their experiences. Being attuned to children and supporting them in this way requires a certain kind of energy. And if parents keep depleting themselves and never take time to figure out what things can help them feel replenished and then make those things a priority along with the others, it's very difficult to stay in the marathon. So investing in your own support network is really critical. And this might include friends, extended family, religious organizations, or other organizations that serve people specifically with motor neuron diseases like um, the Muscular Dystrophy Association or MDA, the ALS Association. And certainly we'd, consider, we'd encourage everyone to consider whether professional support with a counselor could be helpful. Um, the Find a Therapist part of the Psychology Today website has a pretty good search engine, and that's a good place to start in finding someone near you. So we joined the Healy team in January 2019, and while our team brings many years of experience of working with parents and families coping with serious medical conditions, we also recognize that we are learning the unique challenges for parents coping with ALS. So we are in the process of developing a needs assessment that will help us learn more about parents' concerns in a more systematic manner. Information about this assessment will be available in the future, and we look forward to hearing from you and hearing about your parenting concerns or ways in which your family coped that worked well for your children. In the meantime, if you are interested in learning more about our program, there are several PACT-related resources currently available. Our main website, mghpact.org, has a lot of information and includes a number of frequently asked questions and answers, many of which are relevant for the ALS community. Our program brochure is available in the MGH clinic and will be available online in the future. Also, Dr. Moore, along with Dr. Rausch and other colleagues in the PACT program in the Cancer Center, have developed an online course through the MGH Psychiatry Academy for Professionals working with parents receiving cancer care. Though not specific to ALS, the central principles of the PACT model are available through this course, which will be offered again in spring 2020. Finally, Dr. Rausch has written a book that is intended for families coping with serious medical challenges that may be a helpful resource to consider. And just in concluding, we'd like to really just um, express our appreciation, um, especially to the parents and families that we've been speaking with over the last um, eight and a half months or so, um, and also to the MGH Healy Center team, um, some of the nurses we're sitting with right now, um, who've been so welcoming and, so, and helped us learn, you know, try to get up to speed quickly. Um, and then also to the EGL Charitable Foundation for Philanthropic Support that, that has allowed the program to, to get off and running. We're really excited. So um, thank you so much for listening. Um, we do plan to open up to your questions 
Um, but before we do that, um, Cindy and Archna have provided uh, Maggie and I with some questions that they have been getting in our clinic and the answers that they have shared with our patients. So we hope that their answers may be relevant to you and your family. Um, so we're going to go ahead and, and read those questions um, and Cindy and Archna will provide the answers and then after that we're happy to answer um, some additional questions. So um, I'm going to read the first one. Um, my children are very young. They are one in five years old. I worry about how they understand my condition and I'm not sure that talking to them makes sense. Um, so we do work with a number of families who have young children, um, and there are some key considerations in thinking about how to support and uh, explain things to children under the age of six. Um, so with infants, they are preverbal, and um, so their language-based understanding of the diagnosis or the difficulties associated with it um, can happen at a later stage as they get older. In terms of supporting infants, their sense of security is mainly nonverbal, and so having as much consistency in terms of caregivers and routines are especially important. Because infants are also very dependent on their parents for all their needs in a way that older children are not, developing a good support system to um, help you as parents with the daily needs of an infant can be especially important in this regard. Another thing that parents can consider is to think about communicating with their infants um, at a later time through um, creating baby books or photo albums or letters or journals that they can share with their children at a later time. Um, with preschoolers, um, they're often very verbal and uh, we recommend using simple, accurate language followed by a concrete example um, to explain ALS. So earlier in our presentation, we used the example of a house and electricity as one example, um, but that might feel too unrelatable sometimes for young children. Um, but with older preschoolers, another example to consider is to talk about um, how a computer screen is connected to a keyboard through a wire. So to say something like, just like pressing the keys on a keyboard, um, we see messages show up on a computer screen, the brain sends messages to our body parts, and that's how our arms and legs listen to the messages and work. But in ALS, the brain is not able to send messages to the body parts because the wires are not working or they are broken. Developmentally, um, one important thing that is particularly um, of importance with preschoolers is that they are more likely to think of themselves as um, being uh, to blame, thinking of something uh, as their fault. And this can happen because preschoolers tend to associate things that happen together as being you know, the cause of something. So for example, saying something like, my sister likes horses because she's a girl. So they're two unrelated things, but they might think that one thing leads to another. Also, preschoolers are what we call um, egocentric. And what that means is that they see the world through their own experience and own point of view. So how, what that might look like is that a child may think that, oh, all that rough housing with daddy is the reason why his legs are sore, or they might fear that they may catch daddy's illness like a common cold or fever. So in talking to preschoolers about ALS, it would be important to clarify that this is not an illness that either the children themselves or the other parent can catch like a cold or a fever, and that it's not their fault. Parents of preschoolers can also, much like parents of infants, also uh, benefit from maintaining routines and loving limit setting and bedtime rituals so that they continue to get adequate support and a sense of predictability and routine that can communicate stability for them. Maybe you want to ask the next question. Yeah. So the next question is, my son landed an excellent job, but he now wants to stay home and work part-time at a local retail store. I do not think this is the best decision for him. How can I talk to him about it? So this is Cindy. I'll, I'll try to take that one. Um, so I think what that kind of um, gets at is, is a challenge between um, some competing priorities that parents are aware of. You know, in a young adult, as I'm, which I'm sort of assuming this, this child is, um, there's a push towards independence and towards, um, you know, being out more on their own, towards launching, so to speak. Um, 
And then, and, and that's sort of natural. It comes along with the age and the developmental stage. Um, but then there's something about um, having an illness or medical condition in a family member that tends to pull people together and, and keep people closer. And those things are a little bit at odds. Um, and so we hear about this in adolescents and, and also young adults who are, who are sometimes trying to launch and a little bit conflicted about what the right thing to do is. And parents, too, feel like they want to encourage kids to you know, live their lives as they would have even if this hadn't happened, but then also may, may be you know, uncertain about whether that's, that's the right choice, too. So I think um, probably if you've been listening to the rest of the, um, the webinar, it won't be a surprise that we would probably encourage parents to talk with their, um, you know, their young adult about how they're thinking about this. Um, you know, what, what led them to that decision? What do they see as the pros and the cons about that choice? Um, and I think what we hear commonly is parents just feel so distressed that anything about their um, you know, condition is changing something about the child's life. And that's, that's re it's so hard. At the same time, um, that's not a parent's fault. It's not anyone's fault. And it, it, it is something that the family as a group is adjusting to. And so um, helping you know, your child think through what is best for them in the context of being a family member is, is probably really helpful. The other thing along with growing independence that happens with young adults is that they're also forming their own sense of identity. And so your child, the, the child who's saying, I, I, I want to be home, may be creating an identity of themselves as a person who is there for family members. And that's a pretty amazing thing. So not to say that that's always the right decision. It may be the right decision for another child in the same family to you know, go across the country for a job opportunity, and that's fine. But um, it's, it's trying to help the child reflect on kind of the reasons for their choice and, and what are some potential problems with the choice and can you troubleshoot around those and, and sort of talking it through. Great. Okay, this is Judy again with the third question. Um, how do I know if my son needs professional help such as a therapist? And I think, Cindy, you're going to take that one as well? Sure. Um, so I, I think, again, there's no kind of exact one-size-fits-all answer. I think um, as therapists, you know, we, we and, as, and as people who have never met, you know, your children, I think there's always a, a sense that we want to be, um, have a low threshold for seeking support. Um, but um, we also recognize that, you know, if, if you're kind of seeking regular once a week therapy or, you know, every other week therapy, like, there's a cost to that. Um, we get that. It takes time. It, can, it takes money. Um, it takes, you know, logistical um, planning and, you know, transportation and, and all of that. So um, it would be easy to say, well, you know, every child, you know, should have their own therapist. And, you know, that... that could be one answer, and, but I think it's actually not how we think about it. Because um, I also think there's sometimes a cost to, to investing in the time it takes to be, you know, to pursue therapy, um, especially for, you know, young kids and, well, teenagers too, you know, if, if it means that it's taking time away from an activity that um, gives them a sense of, um, you know, being good at something and a sense of being able to connect with other kids, you know, that, that, that's, they're giving up something. It also matters. So I don't think it's just an easy, well, every child, you know, should definitely have a therapist. Um, so with that, I mean, so how do you sort of sort it out? I, I guess for us, we tend to think about, um, you know, first of all, if his child is asking um, and feels like they need to talk to someone or brings that up, that feels, to, I think, often like that's, that's a time to pursue finding somebody. Um, a child who, prior to the diagnosis of ALS, had um, already some pre-existing mental health issues, um, you know, anxiety or depression or ADHD or, or, or anything that maybe makes them a little more vulnerable, that would be a child to keep a really close eye on and, to, again, to have a low threshold for re-engaging the support person when you, you know, when you are maybe seeing um, an, a, even a small increase in symptoms. Um, I think... Um, we, we often think about kind of kids functioning in, in 
several different arenas, so how they're doing at home, how they're doing at school, and how they're doing in peer relationships. And if we think about kids um, having difficulties in like two of those areas um, or, or three of those areas, that becomes a bigger concern than the child who's only seeming a little bit you know, upset or disrupted just at home but is fine everywhere else. Um, and we also think about the duration, like how long are the um, concerning symptoms lasting. If it's a couple of weeks around sort of a change in um, maybe a, a parent's functioning or some other stressor, you know, that, that's a concern and something to watch out for, but not necessarily a reason to seek therapy right away. If changes last for several weeks and longer and don't seem to be improving, then that is also a signal that might be time to pursue something. And, and usually we'll encourage parents to speak to a pediatrician to, um, who has hopefully been someone who's had a long standing relationship with your child and may also have some insight into kind of how they're doing. Um, so that would be a first step. Okay. So next question is, should I tell my teen daughter's class teacher about her father's diagnosis? Her teacher seems friendly. Um, I want her to have someone she can reach out to in school. Well, maybe we'll both yeah, chime. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think, I mean, going back to what I was saying in the presentation about kind of teachers being involved, I think, um, I think talking to your teenager about about their preferences is is really um, a, a first way to go. And again, you know, understanding do they say yes? Do they say no? And if if one teacher, which teacher? You know, teenagers have lots of teachers that they see throughout the day. So um, they may say, oh no no no, my math teacher cannot know. You know, but you know, there may be one other person that they feel o okay about. Um, I think. A teacher who seems nice to a parent may not seem so nice to a teenager. So again, I think getting them to weigh in is, is pretty key. Um, what else? Any other thoughts, Archana? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we've certainly had examples where um, you know teenagers and parents have chosen to share news about the diagnosis with many in the school community and. Schools have partnered with um, families to do fundraisers, and that can feel very supportive. Um, but at other times, uh, we've had children tell their parents that they prefer that this be more private. Um, but as we mentioned in the webinar, I think having some kind of support in the school, even if it's one trusted teacher or, or maybe starting with a school guidance counselor can be really helpful. Uh, and I, I just... I think one of the concerns that teenagers can have is that no one will understand. Yeah. And I think sometimes that's a realistic concern. Yeah, um, this, is, this is a medical condition that is not common enough. Um, yeah. You know, people with cancer, we, we, we all sort of know somebody who has who yeah. has cancer, right? So it's easier to sort of imagine. And even, even kids who have a parent with cancer will say nobody gets what it's like. ALS, it's even um, it's more community. isolating. Yeah. yeah. And so I think, I think kind of listening to what kids say about, you know, well, what is your experience and how, how, what are you hearing from other kids? Are, and, and to ask if, if the information has been shared, you know, so what are people saying? Are your friends saying things that are, are they being helpful? Are they saying things that feel kind of stupid to you? Do, you know, are there people who get it? Are there people who really don't get it? And what are they saying? Yeah. Um, I think that yeah. can be good too. Yeah, checking in along the way. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is uh, Judy again. We have one more question, um, and then again, we'll open it up for a few minutes uh, for any additional que questions you might, might have. Um, the webinar does um, close out at 3.30, but I don't want you to feel like we won't be able to answer your questions, so I'll provide you with an email address that uh, you'll be able to send questions to that I, um, I will forward along um, to Cindy and Archna for, for some reflection. So um, recently my wife has started laughing or crying more than usual. The doctors told us that this is part of her PBA. I don't know what my kids think about it. I am not sure how to explain this to them. Archana, are you going to answer that one? Um, yeah, so PB is a part of the pseudobulbar symptoms, the pseudobulbar yeah. affect. Um, so this is a question that is relevant to uh, several of the families that we work with, um, and one that we as a team are still learning more about, both in terms of how um, parents experience their own pseudobulbar symptoms 
internally, but also ways in which their um, families might experience it, and, and also how to best talk about it. Um, so the first step, it would be helpful for parents to talk this over and to think about uh, whether the language they use best reflects their experiences and, and if that's really how they would like to express it to the children. Um, and then to begin by talking to children about what they might have noticed and to make that connection to the pseudobulbar symptoms. And then maybe saying something along the lines of the fact that you know there's a mismatch between feelings on the inside and the outside um, in, with pseudobulbar affect. So feelings may be smaller on the inside but look bigger on the outside, or that feelings on the inside may be different than the feelings on the outside. So saying something like how mom shows her feelings on the outside may be different than how she feels it on the inside. And if something she says or does feels surprising to you, um, you know, it might be that mom, you might feel that mom did not get it, you know, she didn't, she was laughing too much or said something different. Maybe you could tell her um, that it felt a little confusing or, or come and talk to me about it so that we have a chance to really understand what you were saying, but also for me and mom to explain how mom is feeling, um, to explain that mismatch that, that shows up. Great, thank you so much. Um, we're now available if there are any questions. Um, we're happy to answer those. Um, if there are no questions at this time, then um, if you go to the last screen, I know some people may feel more comfortable sending questions via email, and so I provide here uh, two email addresses. ALS research at partners.org, or you, if uh, you are, I would be happy to take your questions as well, jcarry8 at partners.org, or you can call me. Um, and we are so thankful to both um, Dr. Archna Basu and Dr. Cindy Moore for leading our webinar today. Um, and we appreciate all of you who listened in. And um, Maggie, thanks for being here too, and Natalie for running the, um, running the equipment for us. We hope you enjoy um, the rest of your day. Thanks so much.